If you like listening to True Crime Deadline, then you really should check out one of my favorite true crime podcasts, and it's called Just the Tipsters with Melissa Morgan. Hello, tipsters. This is Melissa Morgan. I'm the host of Just the Tipsters True Crime Podcast because people are awful and they kill each other. Tipsters, this is Melissa Morgan, the host of Just the Tipsters, true crime podcast. Have you ever wanted to kill anyone? Hey, tipsters, my name is Melissa Morgan, and I'm the host of Just the Tipsters, true crime podcast, America's favorite true crime podcast. You can find us on Apple Podcast. I don't know where the, you can find us. How about that? Just can find us and listen, and we're, and you'll really like it. Is that okay? Just the Tipsters with Melissa Morgan is actually available on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe, rate, review. You'll be glad you did. Both podcasts available on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play. Basically anywhere that you can listen to a podcast, we're there and we're waiting for you. So please take a listen, subscribe, and write a review if you're on um, Apple iTunes, which is now Apple Podcasts. A shout out to Jackie XG, Partita31, War Baby, that's with three Ys, and Video Julie. Thank you for your kind reviews. As you guys know, doing a review really helps a podcast like this one get noticed. So thank you. And if you write a review, you're going to get a shout out. Also, some exciting news to tell you. Last week, I found out I'm nominated for another Emmy Award for my true crime reporting in Los Angeles for the Fox affiliate. So fingers crossed. Meanwhile, we're back to a regular episode this week, and we're talking about a murder case. Now, this case, very haunting for years on so many levels, because it took so long to understand what was really happening with this family from Fallbrook that disappeared. Originally, we thought that the family disappeared because they were running from something, but what actually was happening behind the scenes and in real life was shocking and even more sinister. Prosecutors think that they killed him in the house, but there's zero blood inside the house. But it was blunt force trauma, and it was as brutal as you could uh, imagine it. It was blunt force trauma to the head of all of the McStay family members, including the two little boys, which is just nightmarish. The man who would be found guilty of the four brutal murders was convicted in court just last week. It was a very painful trial, and there are still a lot of questions associated with it. And I think what's so fascinating about this, other than um, just the scope of the violence, was this guy, Chase Merritt, Charles Chase Merritt. What's so fascinating about him is he just seemed like your neighbor. He didn't Mm -hmm. seem like a monster. We have a first-hand account of what it was like sitting next to the family during the trial and when that verdict was read. We're talking about the McStay family disappearance and murders. Buckle up, investigators. You're on deadline. From the Hollywood Hills to your ear holes, this is True Crime Deadline. A podcast discussing cold cases, murder mysteries, and completely random thoughts. Now, here's your host, a man who stands in front of crime scene tape and talks on the TV box for a living, Mr. Mystery himself, Matt Johnson. And thanks for joining me for this episode. It's yet another one of those cases that if you know me personally, you know I talk about it a lot. And it's because of what actually happened. It's just so shocking compared to what we were led to believe and what we were able to report at the time because we didn't have a whole lot of information. And there were so many twists and turns in this one. So it all started in 2010. I'm working as a local reporter for the Fox affiliate in San Diego. My cameraman, he's also named Matt. We're Matt Squared. And we're dispatched to Fallbrook, California just outside of San Diego, to a report of a young family who has been reported missing by their family members. And by then, it's already been two weeks. The couple is a husband and wife in their early 40s, Joseph and Summer McStay. And they have two sons, Gianni, who's four, and little Joseph Jr., who's three. 
Summer is a realtor, and Joseph owns a construction company that builds fountains. He has a business partner by the name of Chase Merritt. They live in a modern stucco two-story house that the couple is in the middle of renovating. They're hoping to flip it. They were the quintessential American family, hardworking, uh, working-class folks, kind of stepping up in their investment world. They were making some money. They were having some success. They were winning in the tens of thousands, maybe not the hundreds of thousands. They were starting to make real money, but they were hand-to-mouth entrepreneurs. They were young. Their kids were young. They were in the process of revamping their house. So when investigators came in, there was fresh paint on the wall, and no one really is under, no one understands whether or not that paint was supposed to cover up something that happened. That's Jamie Chambers. He's a reporter with Fox 5 San Diego, and he has covered this case from the very beginning. What do you remember about covering the case when when we first didn't know what had happened to the McStay family? What was so fascinating was it was the story built so slowly. These people are missing the sort of beloved family from Fallbrook. People loved them. They were kind of looking for them. And then all sorts of ideas as to what could have happened to them were thrown out there. There were some experts that were trying to look into it. And then it sort of died off because there was no, there was no bodies found. The leads all went cold. Now for the timeline, it all starts on February 4th. A neighbor's home security camera catches the McStay's white SUV drive off. But you can't actually see who's in the car or who's behind the wheel. And then the same night, there's a call made from Joseph's cell phone to Chase Merritt's phone. But Merritt says that he didn't answer because he was watching a movie. After that, he says he tries to call the McStays, and he can't get a hold of them. So he sounds the alarm. Charles Chase Merritt was the one that called in. He said, hey, I haven't seen Joe. Have you seen Joe? Uh, I haven't seen Joseph anywhere. I haven't seen him. Have you guys seen him? He called He called the mother, he called Joseph's mother, he called the McStay mother, he called the police, and he put on a pretty big show. He put a big show on about, hey, I need to get in because we got to get back to work. How is this going to work? And at this point, family members are worried. So much so that on February 13th, Joseph's brother flies out from out of state into California, and he goes to the house, and he finds a very eerie sight so the family's dogs are tied up in the backyard and then he gets inside the house and the mystery begins the family there is no signs of them there's no signs of struggle and it just looks like the family vanished in thin air there are bowls of popcorn on the couch possibly from the kids um, a carton of raw eggs on the kitchen counter and this is audio of joseph's brother michael walking through that house the detective just told me that this is not a crime scene oh. and I can do whatever I want. Maybe you and your, mo- and your mom and my mom can come in here. Yeah. Now look, all his surfboards are here, so he didn't go surfing in Mexico, guys. <laughs> and Jonah even told the detectives exactly how many surfboards he has. Okay, now look here. Is the double stroller here? Kevin was yeah, saying the that. Double, the double, double stroller. stroller is here. They don't go anywhere without their double stroller. You can hear it in their voice. They're saying, this isn't right. So at this point, the family, they alert the media, and everyone starts speculating. Maybe they left in a hurry. Maybe they were on the run from something. Maybe this was something to do with his business. Neighbors along Avocado Vista say the McStays had only lived here a month or two. They were shocked when sheriff's deputies began going door to door asking questions. They were very friendly when they first moved in to my oldest daughter and they said something about scheduling a play date or something. But they really kept to themselves. They've only been here a couple of months and and they were really quiet. I, I just really, really hope that they're okay. I hope their kids are okay. Very alarming, very scary to think of, especially with children around that, first of all, I didn't know anything about it. So to have this going on on my street is shocking. At this point in time, it feels like every single person in San Diego County is searching for this missing family. And of those that know the McStays personally, they say that they're cooperating with San Diego County sheriffs. So you said you cooperated a great deal with authorities. You were questioned by detectives. What did they ask you? The standard questions, you know, just 
do I know anything about them disappearing? Um, did I have anything to do with it? Um, just, just the standard questions, you know, it's probably they asked everybody. That's Chase Merritt doing an interview with a national news station. And in this interview, he talks about how he was going to write a book about the McStay family and how he believes he's the last person to see them alive. As far as you know, you were the last person or at least one of the last people to see him, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when he left Rancho Cucamonga, nobody else... Uh, although I, th I think somebody, there's another person or two that he talked to. I'm not sure. Um, but you were the last person he saw. I'm not definitely the last person he saw. So then the news gets information that pulls the investigation south, literally, to the U.S.-Mexico border. Yes, good morning. So we're here at the U.S.-Mexico border, the San Ysidro Port of Entry. That's me reporting after the family's white SUV is found parked in a shopping center in San Ysidro located right next to the U.S. port of entry. The sheriff's department telling us they think the family fled willingly, went into Mexico, because on their home computer, there were searches like what children need to travel to Mexico and Spanish language lessons. And then there was that grainy video of the family of four crossing the border at around the time the car was found. And then there was that moment that we saw some footage that looked as if the entire family had gone across the border to Mexico and people just thought, hey, maybe they're running from something that we have no idea about and they were living some sort of other life and, oh, there's another shiny object over here. So that moment that people were really intensely watching the McStays or trying to understand exactly what happened was frittered away into the the media world that we we kind of live and then there were no there were no leads so people kind of went up went on about their lives well three years go by full of false sightings and speculation including some people thinking that summer may have suffered from some sort of illness and committed the murders herself then in 2013 this case cracks wide open everything changes we find out that the family never left california in fact at this point we don't even think that they left their Fallbrook home alive. And it became such a devastating moment when uh, their bodies were discovered in the Mojave Desert by that motorcycle rider, that motocross rider. It was just extraordinary. A three and a half year search for a Southern California family now over. Now the police have positively identified some of the remains found near Victorville. Just yesterday, San Bernardino officials confirmed the remains found in shallow graves near Victorville this week are those of Joseph and Summer McStay. Now, detectives are still working to ID the remains of two children found with the adults. It is believed that they are the couple's two sons, four-year-old Gianni and three-year-old Joseph. Now well, sheriff's investigators start calling it a homicide right away, and they believe that the family died from blunt force trauma inside their home. Prosecutors believe that the murder weapon was a three-pound sledgehammer, which was found also in the shallow grave. Prosecutors also believe the family was tortured. Now, a San Bernardino newspaper is reporting that one of the victims had been bound with an electrical cord, but investigators are not confirming that. A forensic anthropologist is now studying all of those remains to determine when the family died. The area is completely cordoned off. It's so far away from everyone that by the time they've identified these remains, the entire area has been exhumed. So we didn't know if those bodies were from, they could have been from anywhere. They could have been from the 1800s when they were initially found. But mm -hmm. sure enough, uh, when people saw the wrapped up, uh, I, I believe it was carpeting, they were wrapped in carpeting and they had some of the things that the McStay family had and the, the sheriff's department and the investigators kept it quiet for just a little while so they could confirm. And that's when the thing just blew up. And that's when the murder investigation started in earnest and prosecutors felt at the time that they had missed a major critical time period in what they were investigating because they weren't essentially investigating this as a homicide. They were investigating this initially as a missing persons case. So it threw a huge monkey wrench into the procedural way you investigate. 
uh, this process, I believe that initially they didn't do a lot of uh, forensic work in the house, and that would have later complications in in the trial. Um, and so a lot of people were talking uh, pretty badly about the investigators. Why weren't they looking at it? But to their credit and to their uh, their ideas, they weren't looking for dead bodies. They were looking for alive people that may have crossed into Mexico because of that errant video that showed those grainy folks walking across the border. So it, it's, hey, it, no one could imagine that a best friend could have taken out his business partner's family in such a gruesome way. In 2014, detectives with the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office arrest their suspect, the business partner, Chase Merritt. In connection with the deaths after discovering his DNA inside the McStay family car. A big break this morning in a mystery out of California. An entire family, a mom and dad and their two children, they vanished back in 2010. Their bodies were found years later, but still no suspect and no motive. Now, though, we are starting to get real answers. There's been an arrest. Investigators say there was no tip or big break in this case, that this is the result of years of good police work. And now the man who claimed he was the last to speak to Joseph McStay before he and his family went missing is charged with four counts of murder. I need justice from the law and the courts, and most of all, justice upstairs for my lovely family. Charles Chase Merritt now behind bars, accused of killing Joseph McStay, his wife Summer, and their two young sons. The family disappeared from their San Diego home in February 2010, but it wasn't until 2013 that their remains were found buried in shallow graves in the Mojave Desert. The cause of death, blunt force trauma. This is a cold and callous murder of an entire family. And it turns out he's not only the last person to see them alive, but he has a long criminal history and a gambling problem. Prosecutors say that he killed the family over $40,000 and then spent another 20000 on Joseph's business account right after the family was killed. And then he went on a gambling spree at a local casino. He owed Joseph next day $42,000. And that's what seems so interesting. It's $42,000. Right. It's the, it's the worst motive to kill ever and it wasn't like he was going to take over the business because the business fell apart the moment that joseph mcstay disappeared it wasn't like hey i'm going to make a bunch of money off this business and take it to the next level it was forty two thousand dollars as far as the prosecutors could understand how did we end up getting to the suspect so the suspect was there throughout the process he was trying to help he was trying to keep the the business alive for Joseph McStay. He uh, was actually taking cash payments from Joseph's mother. I think he got $5,000 from her saying, hey, keep this business going around. I know he's going to come back. Just make sure everybody at the company is getting paid. So what do we know about uh, Chase Merritt, I guess? And um, when did he get linked to being a suspect? Hi, friends. We are Carl and Joanne, and our podcast is Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. In our lighthearted podcasts, we share our unique ability to find humor in our marriage, adventures, and everyday life. Everything from crashing cars, practical jokes, unique blend of sarcasm, Joanne's ADHD, Carl's ability to be annoyed and entertained at the same time. If you need a little laughter and want to have some fun, find us on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you upload your podcasts. We are also on YouTube. Just search Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. Well, so he had a lot of uh, stories. He had a lot of stories that didn't add up initially. And investigators were trying to figure out where he was and how... uh, where everyone was, why was uh, he part of the the business that Joseph McStay was working? He also owed Joseph McStay $42,000, and that is the Mm -hmm. key motivation that prosecutors pushed on. They said, look, you had a motive. If if these people disappeared, you wouldn't have to pay that 
forty two thousand dollars back, and that is the the ball game for us. Then prosecutors triangulated his cell phone in the Mojave Desert right next to where the bodies were discovered. And that was, I believe, the critical evidence that eventually found him guilty. Once on trial, he fired his attorneys several times and on several occasions tried to represent himself. A stunning twist in the McStay murder saga. Their accused killer fired his lawyer today and asked to represent himself. A bombshell in court as Charles Merritt wiped away tears. Merritt dropped his attorney and will represent himself. The 57-year-old claims he has only months to live, and his lawyer is not capable of giving him the speedy trial he needs. You covered this trial that, um, you know, started earlier this year and it lasted, what, three months? What has that been like? Oh, my gosh, the trial is its probably one of the longest trials I've ever covered. I covered uh, Robert Blake. I covered some pretty big trials in the past that took forever. But this one, I don't, it started in January and finished, what is it, you know, a week ago? Where, where are we? We're in June. Right. I mean, I don't even understand why we took breaks and how these things came about, but there was a lot of, a lot of hanky business, especially with the prosecution not having DNA evidence inside the Merritt household in Fallbrook. That was one of the, the strangest things. So um, that was a real headache for the prosecutors because I don't think their initial uh, layout made sense. They said that the, the murders happened inside the house, no DNA, these blunt force trauma attacks. It's almost impossible to um, have that kind of incident happen. So was there another person involved? That's what's on the mind of all the reporters and the investigators. Someone else could have been involved. This is a big operation for people to be moved a large distance. So there's still unanswered questions, but it was clear that the jury believed that, Mc, uh, that Charles Chase Merritt had a major hand in this whether he did it alone or whether he did it with other people, they felt he was absolutely guilty of the, the deaths. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Charles Ray Merritt, guilty of the offense of murder in the first degree. In violation now, what is the mood like in the courtroom? Uh, it's so you, the, the shock and the celebration were both wild. You can never prepare yourself for someone to be found guilty of murdering an entire family. Just the, the moment that that happens, when the clerk read off the guilty verdict, you could see Charles Chase Merritt just crumble. Um, no skilled actor could pull off the anguish. That is true. No one has ever been able to personify the, uh, that feeling whether he's guilty or whether he's, he's innocent, and obviously he's been found guilty, but whatever the truth is, it was written all over his face when they said, this man's guilty of killing the entire McStay family. The Merritt family has been there the entire time. Two of their family members got up and ran out the door. They were panicked and uh, were just overwhelmed with grief. On the flip side... The McStay family members were in a celebratory, confused mood because they were hugging prosecutors, congratulating each other in some instances. I guess there was some sort of redemptive moment for them, but mm -hmm. in the process, they are the big losers no matter what happens. They have lost everything, and it's, it's just heartbreaking. So this is kind of one of those cases that I would imagine has haunted you also. Absolutely. The, the case was devastating to report on. It was something that you don't ever want to experience in your life, um, especially just the gruesome details that come through this case. And this has just been a, an, a, an emotional uh, case all the way through, and the, the details are very gruesome. It was blow after blow after blow to a child's skull, a three-year-old and a four-year-old. 
That is an intentional killing. Joseph, Summer, and their two children, Johnny and Joseph Jr.'s bodies were discovered by a motocross rider in the Mojave Desert. Prosecutors believe the entire murder case is built around the idea that Chase Merritt killed the McStay's family for roughly $42,000 in financial gain. Defense attorneys argue Merritt would never have hurt McStay, his best friend and business partner, and they say the real killer is out there because the San Diego County Sheriff's made mistakes in the initial portions of the investigation. Sitting through just the imagery of it, you think about what the first responders had to deal with when they actually uncovered the grave sites out in the Mojave Desert. Uh, you know that these are the types of things that haunt people and cause serious PTSD. There's a lot of people sitting on couches talking about this case to their, uh, their psychiatrists because the images were so tough that when we were watching them during the courtroom, people were walking out and I didn't blame them at all. Uh, having kids myself, you just cannot imagine what this tragedy was like for especially the grandmother uh, who called and checked in on, uh, I think the quote she said was, how about the little guys? And when she was told that they were gone, it just absolutely heart wrenching through this whole process. It seems surreal. It doesn't seem like any human that you've ever run into could do something like this. And that's what made it so chilling to be sitting next to Charles Chase Merritt, just, feet away from you, because when you looked at that person, you looked at someone that seemed like a pretty regular guy. He didn't seem like the devil incarnate. He seemed like someone that you kind of knew. He, it, it was hard to wrap your brain that someone could be responsible for something so evil, but in the end, that's exactly what the jury found him of. Guilty of. And did he ever take the stand in his own defense? He didn't. He didn't. Um, through this process. Uh, Yes, he never said a word. Um, he was very respectful to the, um, very respectful to the jurors, even after he was found guilty. And the reason he was was because they still hold the key to his death or life in prison options. So um, that's what they're dealing with. So when um, the verdict was read. Was that a media zoo? Was that a circus outside the courthouse? Was there a lot of, of outside media there? I bet there were two dozen cameras, and that's a lot. That's a lot of media out, outlets there. National cameras, documentary cam cameras, all the locals from Los Angeles, all the locals from San Diego. So it was a busy scene all the way around. This week, Merritt is facing life in prison without the possibility of parole or the death penalty for the murders of the McStay family, Summer, Joseph, Joseph Jr., and Gianni. Bottom line, he will never walk out a free man again. Investigators, thank you for listening. Until next time. Thank you for investigating True Crime Deadline with Matt Johnson. For more information about the podcast, visit truecrimedeadline.com. And remember, all tips regarding a case should go to the police. Until next time. Mr. Gatsby, want a cookie? Good boy. Hey, is this thing on? Oh, well, Mr. Gatsby, I was going to tell the listeners about our cool website, truecrimedeadline.com. There, you can read more about each of the cases. You can see pictures associated with the missing, murdered, and crime scene photos. And you can also submit ideas of crimes that you would like to have covered, or if it's just random questions that you want to ask me. You can find out more about me, your host, Matt Johnson, and you can also learn about upcoming episodes. Aside from the website, we also have a Twitter account, which is at Crime Deadline. And of course, you can go to my Facebook page, Matt Johnson News. Sure wish this microphone was on because I'd tell them. Thanks for listening.